Welcome, guys, uh, back to the Real Wise Podcast. I'm excited to be here and uh, wanted to cover this topic for um, a long, long time. And that topic is where are the housing markets going? Where this is going, in my opinion. I, um, I get this question a lot. I speak a lot, as you guys know, around the country. And I do, uh, of course, this podcast which is new, hasn't been uh, around that long, but I, I do get a lot of questions through marketing this and our webinars and all of the other stuff that we do at uh, our other companies, the Desar Group, um, uh, RealWise, uh, Anton Agency, and uh, our lending company, Oppenheimer. We're, we're always getting these questions of where this market is going. And I wanted to, I wanted to tackle that um, the best I could, by the way. I think that uh, nobody has really a, a, a prediction model that is, is accurate. But um, I think what the best way to handle that is to take, you know, uh, my experience that I've seen now in over 20, well, 20, going on 25 years, I can't Man, I can't believe I'm that old. But uh, what I've seen in the past, what I've heard from people when I first got into the industry from people, their thoughts and what their stories were and things like that, and just my experience um, and, and where I think it's going. So it's not, uh, we don't have this exact precision model. If we did, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I would be uh, on a couple of my yachts or on a private island. I might be doing that anyway, but, um, uh, but nevertheless, this is just my, my best thought with this of what's happening. And, and really the, the utility of this is to uh, think about how you're going to act in the next 12 months, the next uh, five, 10 years. Um, really, I, I normally don't talk about uh, a five-year prediction model, because someone once told me, a wise investor once told me, if you want to make God chuckle, you make a five-year plan. So I typically don't talk about that, but in this particular instance, I think it's important to at least kind of forecast where this is going above and beyond that. But really, you want to think about what your actions are in the next 12 months um, up to you know a five-year period. I think that would be really, really uh, important. Uh, it, let me start off too by saying that history does not exactly repeat itself, but it has a way of rhyming. It rhymes. I've talked about that from stage. I've talked about that with different investors. Um, and uh, it's true. It's happened over and over and over again. Look at the booms and look at the bus. They, they may have a different reason for each one of them, but they all kind of rhyme in how they work. This particular housing market in 2022, this is April uh, of 2022 or the 16th. And um, it, it's an interesting market because not only is the real estate single family house market very high, uh, the multifamily market is also very high, extremely low cap rates, compressing cap rate market. And uh, we're going to talk specifically on the multifamily market uh, here down in a couple of weeks with a podcast that I've got uh, designed for that. But uh, today I want to just keep it to the single family house market. But what I was going to mention is typically when those markets, historically, when those markets uh, interact, they do so in somewhat of an opposite basis. When the single family market is high and a lot of people are buying, there's less renters and vice versa is true. This is not how this market is reacted. And it's, it's important that you guys realize that. It's important that, uh, you know, I think my listeners understand that this market is different than really all of the other markets combined to this point. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I feel like it's different. Um, gosh, 20 years ago, I was getting ready to speak and I was, um, I forgot where I was speaking. I want to say maybe New York City or Dallas or something like that. And I remember drawing a diagram and today we know that as the fish diagram, if you guys have uh, 
uh, been with my teachings and, and have been in one of my classes. I have this fish diagram that I developed. My, my daughter, Peyton, actually named it the fish diagram because it looked like a, a, a fish uh, as I was drawing it. But in it, maybe we can do a, a, a cutout to it um, for those of you watching this on YouTube. But uh, if you can put the tear sheet up for me for that, that would be great. That way you can at least see it. But basically what happens is when uh, the single family house market and the, the multifamily market acts certain ways, you take certain actions. In this particular market, everything is hot. Real estate's hot in general. Single family is hot. Multifamily is hot. You know, and there's a reason for that. But the name, you know, this podcast, I really wanted to, to name it, you know, why I think the market's going to crash and why I think it's going to crash in 2022. And, and sometimes people are like, John, what are you doing? Are you a pessimist? What are you doing? And I, I'm not a pessimist, but I, I'm a, uh, and it's very cliche for, to say a realist, but when I look at the models and I can forecast based off what's happened in the past, and I can also forecast based off of what's happening with monetary policy and what's happening with culture. We need, economists never talk about culture, but we've got a culture politically in this country that um, is, is very div divisive, as you guys probably know. And it's also very uh, you know, divisive, pol uh, uh, the polarity of it, but it's also very, from a monetary standpoint, it is either the faucets are on or they're off. Typically, on both sides, left and right, Republicans, Democrats, they're on a lot of the times. And I've noticed that uh, over the past decade plus, two decades, these, these faucets are on. Why is so much money coming from the government? Um, the government is taking care of us. Well, they have to do that in a way. The stimulus is something where it, it, um, it's addictive. And I think it's addictive for governments. It's addictive for um, countries. It's addictive for citizens. And that in lies part of the problem of why I think there's going to be a major correction and, and uh, a crash. Now, remember, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm not saying that every market is the same. So 2008, when this kind of happened before, um, it was almost like a singularity that happened when Lehman Brothers, that day, you know, you, you probably saw it on the news where uh, all of those people were, were moving their items out of the Lehman Brothers in, uh, on Wall Street. And uh, that was the defined day of the crash for the real estate market. And what's interesting about that is um, the topic of CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. If, you, if you've heard that term before, basically what they do is they package mortgage to get, mortgages together and then they sell them off. They sell them off to funds. They sell them off to, gosh, individuals. They sell them off to companies. They sell them off to even other countries. And what's interesting about the CDOs is people think, oh, well, that's not happening now. And that's wrong. It is happening now. Nothing's really changed with that. And so that's part of my foundation of why I know that a change is coming. And so um, I feel like a change is coming. And let me just kind of give you my premise of why I think that's a good thing for real estate investors, for entrepreneurs, for citizens of this country, um, and, and really for people that are in business in general. Um, Nothing good happens when there's not change and, and uh, there's always change. So that means something as good is happening all the time. But we get caught up in these wavelengths that when the market's going up, we feel like the market's always going to go up. When the market's going down or crashing, uh, and that might be a severe term. I, I, I uh, reserve right to call my discussion of crashing a market uh, a known to be severe. And I, and I don't want to freak anybody out or scare anybody. And it may not be as severe as that, but uh, the market is definitely going to change. And uh, But when it is coming down, people have a tendency to feel like the market's never going to come back up. And I can understand that. Emotion gets in the way. Psychology gets in the way. And uh, this idea of looking at a tree instead of the forest is really the thing that holds people back. But 
when I look at that defining moment in 2008, that's where the difference starts with what's happening today in 2022, 14 years later. And uh, I, I said probably five years ago when this time were to come, it's going to feel like a frog boiling in a pot of wa boiling water. The frog doesn't know he's going to die until it's too late, right? There's no indication because of a frog being co a cold-blooded animal. Different than the day of Lehman Brothers, where it was kind of this, oh, shit, day. You know, you're seeing that on the news. And you're like, oh, shit, something dramatically is going to happen. And it did. And so uh, now, uh, when I look at all of the, the things that put in place my feeling of, of a market change and crash, let's go through them. And I think, um, I think you'll get a little bit of understanding of where I'm thinking this is going to go. And then I'm going to try to give you some thoughts on what people could do to um, have a softer landing or no landing at all, actually. This is a good thing. I just want everybody to know, this is a good thing. You all want the markets to change. Tr trust me on that. You don't want them to keep going like they are. Because if they did, there'd be no opportunity or there'd be less opportunity for entrepreneurs, real estate investors, you know, business owners, commerce in general. Um, for those of you that have not been around me, I'm very much a free market kind of guy. I want capitalism to reign. I don't like less government is better for me. Um, and, and you'll hear this throughout this podcast that um, I believe that government has done very few things good. Now, the things they did good and have do good are massive. You know, obviously, uh, where we are today, we couldn't have gotten here from government positive stuff and government negative stuff. So I'm not saying totally bad. They, they've done totally bad. But man, they do have a way of the majority of the stuff that they deal with and touch to not go so well. Bureaucracy gets in the way, greed gets in the way, um, all those things. And, and I think that's good. That's good for capitalism as well. But those things are ran through the system in a different way in capitalism. So I would like the markets to dictate what's going on, not the government. I'm not a big believer in the stimulus. Did I participate in it? Yeah, hell yeah, I did. Um, and it was, uh, I think, a, a scenario, and I'm just being fully transparent, everybody should have. Uh, you've paid into that. You probably should have taken advantage. Certainly our business was struggling a little bit with, with COVID and, and some of the changes. So, you know, that's what that was, a lot of that was there for. There, there was others as well that um, benefited from the stimulus. And I don't want to, I don't want to uh, neglect the idea that there were very serious issues and problems. And I don't want to ever see anybody, you know, uh, harmed or damaged by that. And the government at some point was there for that. But the amount and level of stimulus, I think, was done overboard. And this was on both sides of the aisle. This is not just one or the other. This is a chronic problem for the United States of America. This is not one or the, or the other. Now, I probably um, I probably am more of a, a of a alt middle kind of guy, uh, and and both parties seem to have their way of thinking about crisis and stimulus and things like that. But uh, I think that we are in for a change now, and and that's part of it. So let me give you a couple of uh, of ideas of why I think a change is coming. Um, Number one, uh, a change is coming because uh, the housing demand was where it is today, was created in a sense by COVID. COVID-19 that happened in 20, March of 2020, the start officially to where it is today, uh, it's pulled back a little bit, may come back. We don't know. That story's still out. But we didn't really have a housing shortage until that. I, I think about that. Now, do we have some cities that were building more than others? For sure. Um, but a, a nationwide housing shortage, like it's said today, you know, we we build about, you know, I think it's on average 700, 750,000 units to a million units a year, somewhere in there, and that could fluctuate. But 
we just didn't have it like it is today. And I think that was because of the eviction laws. I think that was because of the um, uh, non foreclosure uh, scenarios that were going on or the borrowing from that. And so this created this need, this desire, not to mention the stimulus. That was the third thing. People had and have more disposable income during that time for whatever reason. The ironic thing is they left their jobs. They weren't working either because of COVID shut them down or this great resignation that's kind of going on, uh, shut it down. So I feel like that's one of the pieces that are causing this housing crash is this this uh, euphoric, this fake housing demand that's going on. And I see it here in all the markets that we work in, Illinois, Indiana, Florida. Uh, here in Northwest Indiana, they're building like crazy. Um, and, and there's certain reasons for that. But man, I feel like this is a little bit overdone. And, and that's reflective in the builder stocks. If you go to some of the builder stocks uh, over the last 10 months, you'll see a dramatic change. They're down 30, 40, 50%. Um, the stock market is a really good prediction of uh, forecasting the future or one of the ways that you could do that. And when I see groups like Lennar, for instance, and, and the other national home builders down by that much, um, uh, I feel like a change is coming in that they know something we don't. Uh, the professionals in uh, on Wall Street are saying, look, less people are going to be buying all of these houses that you're building. Why? Why is that happening? Well, I think the biggest culprit of that, my friends, is number two that we're talking about, and that is interest rates. Uh, interest rates are really, really important when it comes to housing booms and housing crashes. Um, we, it is almost a little bit of a cliche that everyone talks about how uh, interest rates but they really don't understand that side of the market. About a year ago, the 10-year treasury, now this is a bond, that's the bond market, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit, but the 10-year bond market was significantly lower than it is today. It was at, you know, maybe a buck five, uh, buck oh five, uh, and today it's at two eight, something like that, and rising, I think it's gonna blow through three, I think it's gonna go to, 3.3, something like that. And what you've seen is the refis dramatically stop on the residential side of the market. The refi refinances of houses and condos and townhomes have really, really stopped because it doesn't make sense for people to do that today with a higher market. The 10-year treasury has a lot to do with that. But the other thing that I'm seeing here is uh, new purchases start to slow. I'm also seeing new construction I see from the stats that we've got um, buyers pulling out of, of markets, uh, pulling out of, sorry, build contracts because they can no longer qualify for that home. Check this out, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which just a short time ago was 2.75, is now over five. It's you know 5.1, 5.2, somewhere in there. And I think that's only gonna climb. I think it's gonna go to six. And I think that's gonna be one of the biggest biggest daggers for the housing market. It is already dramatically slowing. And again, let me go back to my frog in the boiling pot of water. They don't really know because right now, the, I listen to communication, the communications like, hey, the, the builder stocks are undervalued right now. We need to go back in. Uh, that, that's what I'm hearing. The other thing that I'm hearing is, hey, this is only temporary. Uh, that we're going to go back. You heard it initially when the Fed the Federal Reserve of the United States of America was talking how this was a transitory system of inflation. Transitory meaning quick, it's just supply chain, don't worry about it, it'll come back to normal. Obviously, that was not true. Anytime you flood the market with dollars and you print money and you sell these bonds to other, company, uh, other companies, well, some maybe, uh, sell these bonds to other countries and uh, you know they are paying for these bonds and they see this dollar is getting weaker and weaker and the U.S. government's like, well, look, we've got to raise that bond yield. We've got to raise that bond yield so that other countries will buy our bonds so that we can print the money, you see. A bond is just a promise to pay. 
So the interesting thing about that is more countries over the last five years have decided not to buy our bonds. Everybody needs to take a pause here because that is one of the biggest things that I think is, we're not talking, that's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Uh, is the world losing faith in the US dollar? Yeah, that's gonna affect the housing market guys, for sure. Uh, that's number three, by the way. So because the world is losing, losing faith in the US dollar and other dollars such as the um, uh, uh, Chinese and, and the Russian and you know some of the other uh, world powers are coming up with their currencies as far as strengthening that and deciding, hey, I'm not gonna be using the dollars, the world's reserve currency. I'm gonna find another way to do this. I'll buy oil in another way, perhaps. I will do other things. There's a, uh, I won't cut to that now, but there's an interesting story on Saudi Arabia and how they're selling oil in non-US dollars and they're putting contracts together to a, a, a get away from that. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on that, but that's those are some of the baseline items, the foundation of which is giving me this thought that this is going to change. But because countries are buying our, our bonds less, uh, the Federal Reserve has stepped up over the last five, eight years, probably since 2009 actually. So that's more than eight, that's, that's 11 years. Is it 2009, 19? So it's, it's 12 years, John, 12 years. Math, uh, I thought was a pretty strong point, but you know, 12 years, it's 12 years. So 12 years ago, our Federal Reserve started to buy our bonds. And uh, you know, not only did they buy bonds, but they were also buying these packages of mortgages packaged up and almost like the C, DOs, collateralized debt obligations that we did in 05, 06, 07 that led to that crash. And the Federal Reserve has come out and said, yeah, we're going to raise interest rates to battle inflation. They need to because inflation is not transitory, my friends. It's here. Uh, go to the grocery store, go to the gas station. Uh, you will see it for sure. And this is also leading to other things. You know, I don't want to get into the uh, supply chain model. We are talking about that on, on a couple of weeks here in an upcoming podcast with uh, somebody, but um, th we'll, we'll definitely deal with that. But um, inflation is here and inflation is too much money chasing too few goods and services. Uh, inflation has been around for a long time, ever since we we uh, started getting into what the dollar is in 20, and sorry, 1913, when the Federal Reserve was created, all the way through like getting off the gold standard in the 70s. And that was really the, the fuel that hit uh, and talk about inflation a little bit. If you remember inflation from the 70s and then the 80s, uh, gosh, interest rates in the 80s were in the low teens, mid teens, maybe even higher teens um, there. So we have it now. Get, get over it. If you think it's transitory, you're wrong. Uh, this is true inflation by every definition. Too much money chasing too few goods and services. This is the definition of inflation. This is what it feels like. Go, through, go to the grocery store and walk around and look at the prices. Go to the grocery store, walk around, look at the shelves. Are they full? Probably not. Go to the gas station, look at the gas. This is inflation. This is what it feels like. This is what inflation felt like in the 70s. This is what inflation felt like in the 80s. I think we're at a 40-year high here. Will it go higher? I believe it will, but because uh, I think the Fed has more work to do. Uh, but because the Fed has raised interest rates, uh, you're not only are the price of items getting higher, but the cost of money is getting higher. We're going to talk about that. And then finally, this balance sheet reduction, they're buying these packaged mortgages because they wanted people to buy houses. And that's what happened. They kept interest rates on residential mortgages res relatively low, but they can't do it anymore because the balance sheet is too big. They're buying between 800 and 900 million, 800 and 900 million per month. Uh, and they can't keep doing that because they feel like that is one of the things that is leading to the world losing faith in the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. So that's changing, my friends. The Fed is uh, not only they've stopped doing that, but they're also and that's going to raise interest rates in addition to what the Fed is doing with the benchmark rate 
the, the 10-year treasury rate that's going up and things like that, all of that putting pressure on that. So I, I feel like those rates are going to go through the 5.2, where it kind of is now 5.1, 5.2, 30-year fixed now I'm talking. And then on through six, I think it's going to go to six. And historically, historically, I feel like, I remember doing models. For those of you who've been with me for a while, I've had people been with me the last 20 years on my teachings and exercises. And for those of you that remember this PAR exercise I would do, we'd run rates at between six, about six and a half, 6.5 as an interest rate. Traditionally, that's kind of where it's, it's, it's where markets battle to get to what is called equilibrium. Um, I'm thinking of all these diagrams I use. Markets, whether it's the stock market, gold market, real estate market, bond market, they all fight for equilibrium. The pressure of a market to go up is also battling against the pressure for the market to go down. And uh, so you have this equilibrium battle. And then as those, we call that uh, frequency in our, um, in our uh, classroom mode uh, for RealWise and the Dessar group. But during this frequency is the length of time that happens. So we've been in a, you know, a bull market here since for a long, long time uh, here. And uh, that frequency, the length of time on that is about to change. And it starts with real estate. Um, and then I think you're going to see that also with stocks as well. Uh, overpriced. Are, is real estate overpriced? Yeah, it is. Um, but somebody's willing to pay. So there's a market to find there. But in my mind, it's overpriced. been overpriced for a while. The stock market, I believe it's overpriced. If you look at how tough our country is financially in the situation that we're in. And you look at corporate bonds, not the US bonds, but on the corporate side, the junk bond market is relatively popular right now because of so many people being in that junk, junk bond market. Corporate bonds are terrible. They have more corporate debt than they've ever had before. All of these interest rates that are going up is, is going to affect all of that. And I'm not here to talk about stocks on this podcast, but I'm talking about the real estate market. And, and because the Fed is going to not only stop buying these packages of mortgages and really kind of backing those, uh, and they're going to start getting rid of those to limit their balance sheet and shrink their balance sheet, you're going to see interest rates rise and you're going to see it rise for a more permanent basis. And the, the longer that that takes to settle in, the more that you're going to see people start to think, oh, shit, it's not going to be a day like Lehman Brothers. It's the frog in the pot. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't realize it yet, this is your Lehman Brothers Day watching this podcast. August, August. It's not August yet, John. April 16th, 2022. I'm telling you, this is your Lehman Brothers Day. Is there a crash coming, John? I don't know. Uh, markets and cycles tend to, they're not exactly the same, but they tend to rhyme. This is going to rhyme a little bit. Could it rhyme worse than 08? Maybe. Could it rhyme a little less than 08? Maybe. Uh, but it's going to change. And uh, I was in... I was in Austin, Texas um, a few weeks ago and I was speaking there and I have a friend that lives there and we were doing some touring and I, and I was at a real estate uh, event that I was speaking at. I was listening to the crowd. I was listening to the other speakers. I was listening to real estate agents from the Austin, Texas market. By the way, if you're in Austin, I, I love your city um, and I'm not knocking it with about, with about what I'm going to say. But when, when I would listen to locals talk about the Austin market, they were so bullish about it. And they said, the market here will never go down because there's more people moving in to this market than there is moving out. And there has been a big migration of people from California, let's say, moving to Austin and things like that. But I'm a big believer in listening to communication to dictate what's going to happen in the future. And do you know that's the same message that was told to me in 2006 when I go to markets like New York City, uh, Las Vegas? Phoenix. Um, I'm telling you guys, markets change. And, and if you don't believe me, go back and look at the stats of those markets. What you're going to see is some dramatic, dramatic uh, changes in real estate values. 
So I think we're going to have a moment when that is happening. Uh, again, I can't tell you exactly about that, but I know it's happening. Like I can forecast this. I'm not a magician or a wizard or anything like that. I'm just using um, my experience and I'm using uh, the, the network in my community that I surround myself with uh, for that as well. I was speaking on a podcast in January about the 10 year treasure. And I said, guys, this thing is going to go uh, a lot higher than it is uh, today. And look at back at January to where it was, um, you know, six months prior to that. And then look at January to now, maybe I can put that up there, the 10 year treasure, I can show you guys what is going on with that. Um, but you, you can, uh, so look, get a second look at that and, and you can see the change that's happening. It's the frog in the pot, guys, time to wake up. So what do you do? So, so that's what um, I, I kind of want to leave you guys with on this podcast. What do you do? Number one, breathe, relax. Don't freak out. Uh, kudos to you for even getting to this point where you're like, okay, I understand a change coming. Now I need to put myself in a position of what to do. Number one, if you're looking to buy a house, buy a house you can afford and you like and buy the damn house. Okay, that's number one. Um, if you love the house and you can afford the house, buy the damn house. Get that out of the way. Number two, um, if you're a flipper, meaning flipping houses, I don't know. Some of my audience might take that a different way. I don't know what that would mean. But if you're flipping houses right now, now's the time to get out of that. Get in and get out. Do not stay with it. Do not take on a project that you think is risky. Do not... Um, uh, think that you're going to make this long term, I would take a little bit of a pause there because your time will come. Your time will come be where you're going to be the solution provider for challenges that are about to happen here and uh, that, that are going to take place. So I would say if you're a flipper, if you're a, uh, a real estate investor in other areas like multifamily and things like that, I think you too need to pivot. I've been in that space for a long time. I've been speaking about it for a long time. And again, I hear the same thing when people are buying these projects at cap rates that are really, really low, like have compressed for a while and they're not cash flowing, but they've got an upside if they raise rents. Guys, I'm here to tell you that raising rents and the ability to raise rents in a lot of properties uh, has come, gone and come by the way, come and gone by the wayside, meaning the reason that we've had such a, and I want to talk about this in my upcoming podcast about multifamily. The reason that we've had such an increase in pricing in the multifamily space and compression of cap rates is because the net operating income has grown so much. Why? Because the stimulus money that was passed out was enabled those tenants to pay a higher rent. Uh, if I go and look, I'm a little bit of a historian, I guess, but if you go back to Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, written early in the 1900s. The Wealth of Nations talks, of, maybe even earlier than that, The Wealth of Nations talks about supply and demand. That's where this classic model really kind of got a lot of popularity. But if you read the section that Adam Smith talks about, he's like uh, talking about the idea that when demand outpaces supply, prices rise. But there's a key word there. And the key word is ability, ability to pay. And if people don't have the ability to pay the rent, it doesn't matter that demand outpaces supply. On the single family house market for buying real estate, buying a house, a townhome, a condominium, same thing applies. If the people don't have the ability to pay that price for that single family residence, townhome, condominium, even though demand may seem like it outpaces supply, the market will change. That's why you have builder contracts in the, in the clients being pulled out because these builders put these clauses in there that, hey, if interest rates rise, you have the ability to get out of the contract. They never thought they would rise. Hello, it's 2022, April, they're rising. And, and now they're pulling out. And, and that's going to be a little bit of a challenge for these new buyers. That's why their stock price is down or one of the reasons. So anyway, the, the, the next thing is to get educated. I don't know who you're with or, or what group you're with or community, but surround yourself with people that are entrepreneurs, business minded, that are going to take action in 
the face of fear, take action in a changing market. If you're a real estate investor, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, a parent, um, a citizen, a worker, a W-2 worker, 1099, this is good for us. We need a little bit of this change to churn up opportunity. And I believe there's going to be a lot of it. So uh, what to do is uh, keep taking action. If you're not buying, educate. If you're not educating, start to ask the question why. And if you're not getting ready for the very thing that's going to happen in the next, uh, in this change that's happening right now, you're not going to be ready for what's coming. And I don't want that to happen to you. So uh, stick with us. You're going to hear more about this. The market crash of 2022. Is it going to be worse than 2008? Don't know. Maybe. It's going to be less worse than 2008? Don't know. Maybe. But you, my friends, have to be ready for either thing, either case. Remember, wealth has nothing to do with money. Success has everything to do with failure. And life is as simple as you make it. Thanks for joining the Real Wise podcast. We will see you on the next one. And we'll talk real soon. Thanks, guys.